Hi everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with the series finale. Man, Zhao Tuo and the Lac Viet seemed like ages ago. CHP 202 this time, part 6 in this series where we, well not the royal we, attempted to get a nice glance at this 2,000 year old relationship. China and Vietnam have had their ups and downs throughout the centuries. We looked at the good and the bad. In offering this general survey of the relationship, plus what we'll look at today, perhaps some of you moving forward can all have a better appreciation of that relationship. In this episode, everything will start to become more familiar. Well, modern times, it's what's most relevant to us and what we can most relate to. Last episode, we ended with the Chinese down on their luck after another embarrassing defeat, this time at the hands of the French Navy in the Sino-French War, August 1884 to April 1885. Between the damage done to the Chinese Navy in Fuzhou by the French, and then later on after the Sino-Japanese War, 1894-1895, China had hardly any navy at all. (laughs) Not like today. Well, I said I wasn't going to wander off into the whole other world of French Indo-Chinese history. Most of it didn't involve China. After the Sino-French War, France got a free hand down in Vietnam, and China's periodic domination and influence down there, already greatly diminished, came to an end. It was a heck of a run. The days when the Han, Southern Han, Liu Song, Song, Yuan, Ming, Qing... When China could just march in and take over the whole Red River Valley and get away with it, that was a thing of the past. The Vietnamese had to be asking themselves, how did all this happen? How did they end up in the same boat as the Chinese? How was it, in such a short period of time, Vietnam found itself in such a helpless state in the face of French military force? Just as some intellectuals and students in China pointed to Confucianism as a contributory cause for China's woes, it was the same in Vietnam. A lot of what they were saying in China was being echoed in Vietnam. Their Confucian system may have been fine and well before, but now it had become irrelevant and, in fact, had made it easy for the Vietnamese to become overpowered by the foreigners, and it offered no solutions on how to get rid of them. The Vietnamese, they saw the same things going on in Japan that China did. Just as there was this thirst in China to find a solution to the country's predicament, same was felt in Vietnam. Vietnamese students and intellectuals also went to Japan to study their development model. And they observed and they learned. To many patriots in China and Vietnam, there was this curiosity, this need to know how the Japanese, these Asian people like them, how did they modernize? How were they able to so quickly get up to snuff and stand up to the foreign powers? And in the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905, even defeat them. So off to Japan, many of these Vietnamese went to check out the scene and study the merits of this Japanese social, political, and economic model. One of the students who went to Japan to see for himself was Nguyen Sin Kong. When I was growing up in Chicago during the 60s, when the Cubs infield third to first with Sano Kessinger, Beckert, and Banks, we knew him as Ho Chi Minh. The facts, stories, and nationalist legends attributed to this revolutionary hero are well-worn, starting from his time beginning in 1911 when he worked as a cook on a ship traveling between France, New York, and Boston. He worked as a dishwasher and a cook for a while in London during World War I and got out and saw the world. Ho Chi Minh's life was similar to Zhou Enlai, but each was unique in its own way. Just like Zhou, Ho moved to Paris in 1917, and it was there, in France, where he first heard about the Bolshevik Revolution. There he received his first exposure to communism. A familiar story, same thing happened to Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, Chen Yi, Nye Rongzhen, and, and others. Ho was in Paris from 1917 to 1923, and went by the name Nguyen Ai Guk. Ai Guk, in Chinese, is pronounced Ai Guo, means patriot. The French Communist Party was formed in 1920. Ho Chi Minh became a founding member as the representative from Indochina. He got his first taste as a member of the French Socialist Party. 
united in this cause, he struck up a friendship in Paris with Zhou Enlai that lasted a lifetime. Incidentally, it was starting to happen about here, 1920s, that Vietnamese Guk Ngu, or Guo Yu, began to gather steam, just as the vernacular was taking China by storm. China had their Lu Xun's, Lao She's, Ba Jin's, Zhang Ailing's, who emerged in China during the 20s and 30s. Again, it was no less different in Vietnam. They, too, had their literary greats who knew exactly how to craft the vernacular language in such a way that they could articulate the moment and offer solutions on the best path for the country to take. Vietnamese language journals, pamphlets, and books were printed and passed out like never before. You see, 1919, the Confucian-style civil service exams were ended in Vietnam after nine centuries in use. Ngo Quyen, remember him, the Ngo dynasty founder? He had brought them back when he set up his dynasty in 939. Now they were abolished. It probably worked well for staffing the government in its day, but this was now... 86ing the civil service exams based on the Confucian classics. Well, that was akin to the Catholic Church abandoning Latin. There'd no longer be any need for anyone to learn it. It was the same with classical Chinese in Vietnam. All you needed to know now was Vietnamese guk ngu. Like their Chinese neighbors to the north, Vietnam saw the same rapid industrialization during the 1920s and 30s with railroads, factories, and all kinds of infrastructure projects. The French had quite an enterprise going on in Indochina. This period right here is around the time my in-laws were born. 1924, Ho Chi Minh went to Moscow to continue his communist education. The Comintern later sent him to China, where he stayed for the next 20 years. He openly trained and hung out with the CCP until the Shanghai Massacre in April 1927. After that, like most all communists, he went underground. In China, Ho carried out his organizing activities on behalf of the Vietnamese communists. There was a half century to go yet before Ho Chi Minh would enjoy his final victory, though he didn't live to see it. In February 1941, after making a lot of contacts and receiving a fine education, Ho left China and returned to Vietnam. This was his first time back since 1911. He began organizing at once. Surprisingly, the Vietnam Communists' earliest backers were the KMT, not the CCP. Chiang Kai-shek was hoping to win the Communists over to his side. Jiang was particularly sensitive to the treatment of Chinese who had long migrated to Vietnam and now called the place home. He didn't want them treated as second-class citizens in their own adoptive country by the French authorities. China's concerns for the Chinese of Vietnam will also become a hot-button issue again as the 1970s gathers steam. The Viet Minh, or League for the Independence of Vietnam, was formed in May 1941 by Ho Chi Minh. It was around this time, with the world at war for the second time, that the Viet Minh began their rise and started mobilizing peasants and put the whole enterprise in motion that would one day lead to the victory of the communists in Vietnam. I'm going to bandy his name about in a similar way that historians use Mao Zedong to anthropomorphize the collective efforts of the CCP. Just as Mao and his comrades in arms co-founded the People's Republic of China together with him, it was the same in Vietnam. Don't let me fool you with any propaganda that suggests Ho Chi Minh did this all by himself. If I had to mention four others whose names were paramount in this history and worth remembering, those would be Phan Ban Dong, Vong Nguyen Giap, and starting in the 1950s, Lei Yun and Lei Duc Tho. Lei Duc Tho. Some of you from my generation might remember him. He was the one who was co-awarded the uh, 1973 Nobel Peace Prize with... Dr. Henry Kissinger for ending the Vietnam War, but if you recall, just like Marlon Brando did that very same year at the 1973 Oscars, Le Duc Tho declined the award. In trying to focus on where the nexus was between all the history happening in the first half of the 20th century and China-Vietnam relations, the history books start to thin out a lot here. Each country had their own party and political issues to sort out. And although there were similarities between the experiences of China and Vietnam, 
They both had their hands full, and despite their shared history, both nations were forced to deal with more pressing issues closer to home than their bilateral relations. One interesting story involved an incident during World War II. In November 1944, Viet Minh fighters rescued a U.S. airman whose plane went down just south of the China-Vietnam border. Ho Chi Minh personally led the escort that brought the airman safely back to his base in China. There he met with the legendary Claire Chenault, a great American hero who we featured in the two Flying Tiger episodes, CHP 151-152. For his efforts, Ho returned to Vietnam in May 1945, along with a team of U.S. military and OSS spooks, so-called advisors. And this relationship, as we know isn't going to last. Same with the Dixie Mission in China. That communism thing, that was a deal-breaker in both cases. In March 1945, Japan will make a last-ditch effort to hold on to what they had in Vietnam and preempt any efforts by the French to get rid of them. Remember, the Japanese military had kept the French in place in Indochina to manage things for them. They launched a surprise offensive against French Indochina officials who were all overthrown. In its place, Japan set up a kind of Manchukuo government in Vietnam with the last Nguyen Emperor, Bao Dai, playing the Puyi role. The Vietnamese weren't so keen on having the French around and so tolerated and cooperated with the Japanese occupiers in an enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of a way. We all know, however, that it all comes crashing down in the end, and the end was pretty near at this point. By June of 1945, the Viet Minh forces had gotten rid of the Japanese occupiers in the north of Vietnam. Two months later, it was over. And on August 30th, Emperor Bao Dai abdicated. Then, two days later, on September 2nd, Ho Chi Minh declared independence in front of half a million people in Ba Din Square. And he announced the creation of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. This was Vietnam's moment, similar to... Mao's declaration of the founding of the PRC on Tiananmen 10 1949. Ho Chi Minh got to have his moment first, but he only had half the country. As soon as the dust settled, all political prisoners in the North were rescued and released. And these included many of the future first generation leaders of Vietnam. They all had one shared mission at this point get rid of the French colonialists, set up a new unified country. Let's go over what happened next, after World War II ended. We've looked at how this all affected China. Again, it was a familiar story with what happened in Vietnam. Uh, up in China, the Chinese nation, oh man, almost a hundred years of saying yes sir, yes sir, to the foreign imperialist powers, then eight savage years of Japanese aggression, and finally four more years of bloody civil war. And then in 1949, China was liberated. In Vietnam, it took until 1954. Let's quickly look at the road, or at least the stepping stones, to Dien Bien Phu. It's quite a history, Vietnam, right after the Japanese surrender. Again, let's try and stick to the China part of it all. Well, you know the story. World War II ended, Japan retreated back to their country, and began the rebuilding process. An almost $5 trillion GDP today. Ooh, they had a long way to go back in 1945. The French thought they might slip their feet right back into those nice, furry Louis Vuitton slippers and pick up where they left off before the Japanese came and ruined everything. Imperialism, colonialism, that started to take on an even worse odor after World War II than it had before. So World War II was over and what to do about Vietnam. Without getting into the gory details, at this time, right at the end of World War II... The Viet Minh forces were still rather small and couldn't yet stand up to the Allies when the decision was made to cut the country in half at the 16th parallel. As far as China-Vietnam relations went, the KMT was still the legitimate government of China. They came in about 100,000 strong, mainly in the north of Vietnam, and attempted to fill the vacuum left by the vacating Japanese. Their mission get Vietnam on their side and not on the side of Mao. Britain at first did the same in the South. They were acting as placeholders for the French. Britain was still hoping to cling to their Asian colonies, and, well, it wouldn't have helped their cause if Vietnam booted the French out. What would they say in Malaya? 
Singapore, and Hong Kong. The communist Viet Minh, they controlled the north of Vietnam. Viet Minh sympathizers down in the south were, you know, slowly driven out by a potent force of remnant Japanese forces fighting with the French and British. Everybody started running to their side of the fence. French troops began to pour in, and they began to play for keeps. The last nine years of the French occupation would be brutal. This was a very complicated and messy shakeout period in Vietnam following the end of World War II. There were a lot of different factions on all sides, even within the Vietnam Communist Party. Ho Chi Minh had been trying to find some way after the war to befriend the U.S., The CCP had done the same thing since before with the Dixie mission. Ho pulled out all the stops, and negotiations went all the way up to the 11th hour. But, like his good friend and communist brother-in-arms, Cho En Lai, Ho Chi Minh had to walk away empty-handed from Uncle Sam in the end. And there were more than a couple moments in history where, as an American, you could perhaps say, here a seed was planted for the Vietnam War. In March of 1946, Chinese forces vacated the north of Vietnam, and the Viet Minh had to make all kinds of concessions. Now, their army was getting stronger, but it wasn't in the same league as their opponents yet. So, Ho Chi Minh had to look the other way when part of the deal of China's withdrawal involved allowing 15,000 French soldiers to come in and restore order and essentially occupy the north. (laughs) <laughs> There's this famous story about this moment in history. Like a lot of nationalist history, it never actually happened, but it really caught fire and became part of the legend of Ho Chi Minh. And it really hits home about how China and Vietnam's shared history was viewed by some. When criticized for allowing the French back in, rather than to allow the Chinese to remain, Ho, as the story goes, replied, quote, You fools! Don't you realize what it means if the Chinese remain? Don't you remember your history? The last time the Chinese came, they stayed a thousand years. The French are foreigners. They are weak. Colonialism is dying. The white man is finished in Asia. But if the Chinese stay now, they'll never go. As for me, I prefer to sniff French shit for five years than eat Chinese shit for the rest of my life. End quote. Back ho, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't the right time in the USA to be talking about making peace with communists. So with China, with Vietnam, the chance came, the chance went. And here we are. By the end of that year, 1946, along came the First Indochina War, or the Anti-French Resistance War, as it's called in Vietnam. This is to differentiate it from the Second Indochina War, known in Vietnam as the Resistance War Against America, and... Where I come from, we call it the Vietnam War. Democratic Republic of Vietnam forces in the meantime, under Vong Nguyen Giap, had really been strengthening. They too were playing for keeps. And while all this is happening, 1945 to 1949, and then into the Korean War, China was engulfed in their own turmoil. Once the communists emerged victorious in China in October 1949, China-Vietnam relations entered a whole new era. Let's quickly run through what happened in Vietnam. In December 1946, the French invaded Hanoi and Hue. Ho Chi Minh and Vong Nguyen Giap used the same playbook as Mao Zedong and Zhu De. So the French were often forced to fight a guerrilla war. Most of the fighting was in the north. Vong Nguyen Giap led the People's Army of Vietnam Ho Chi Minh led the Viet Minh against a coalition of forces lined up with the French. Vong Nguyen Giap went to China in January 1950 to discuss military support in their fight to get rid of the French. China started shipping weapons, training Vietnamese troops, building roads, and, well, doing whatever they could. This would all come to a dramatic climax at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, May 7th, 1954, where France, with the help of Chinese advisors and Soviet equipment aiding the Vietnamese, met their Waterloo in Indochine. Right on the heels of the fall of Dien Bien Phu came the April 26th to July 20th, 1954 Geneva Conference. Not terribly constructive. U.S. and China not talking to each other. 
As we recall from so many past episodes, once the U.S. lost China, quotation marks around the word lost, the matter of stopping the spread of communism in Asia became almost the single-minded purpose of U.S. foreign policy. With the French departure from Indochina, who was going to ensure that these communists didn't go around spreading their poisonous ideology to Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Burma, and who knows, even India, and maybe even our new BFF in Asia, Japan. President Eisenhower didn't coin the term, but he was the one who warned of these Asian dominoes falling one after another. So the Geneva Conference, that was supposed to deal with these pressing issues. The USA was already four years into the Red Scare and McCarthyism, so it was doubtful the Geneva Conference was going to produce a satisfying result. Well, we know what happened. Geneva Conference, the scene of the alleged historic incident when John Foster Dulles refused to shake Zhou Enlai's hand. Vietnam got cut in half. Communists north of the 17th parallel and a Western-backed regime of strange bedfellows to the south. The Vietnamese people were left with a choice of two nice dictatorships. The DRV in the north, Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and in the south was the SVN, or State of Vietnam. Mind you, this was only supposed to be a temporary fix. Elections were set for 1956. If that's not a recipe for war, I'll eat my hat. By the time America dove headfirst into Vietnam in the 1960s, Ho Chi Minh was already in bad shape. He was suffering from a number of ailments and maladies, including diabetes. By the time American troops were pouring into Vietnam, he was already in the back seat. Ho remained a figurehead to Vietnam's revolutionary struggle and a bogeyman for Americans like me, who heard his name every night on the evening news. The real power was Le Yuan. Ho Chi Minh died on September 2nd, 1969, 24 years to the day that he had his moment declaring the nation's founding at Ba Din Square. Well, Vietnam War, 58,220 American troops perished, over 300,000 wounded. No need to rehash all that here, or the 3 million Vietnamese civilians who died in the crossfire, the Agent Orange. Eh, that's a different podcast. End of April 1975, Saigon fell. My wife's family bolted from Vietnam. 1976, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam was declared. It's still around today. A vacation paradise. I have it on good authority. 1955 to 1975, not too much happening in China-Vietnam relations. China had their own problems, and sino Viet relations wasn't near the top of their list of priorities. The Great Leap Forward, the terrible famine that followed, the power struggles in the Chinese Communist Party, the Cultural Revolution, and then don't forget, Vietnam's public enemy number one, Richard M. Nixon. He visited China and jump-started USPRC relations. Vietnam history tends to play down the importance of the role played by China in the Vietnam War, but they were on Vietnam's side. Not in the Korean War sense. U.S. forces didn't face them on the battlefield. China was on Vietnam's side, and that's one of the main reasons that brought Nixon to Beijing in 1972. The photo at Capitol Airport with Zhou Enlai shaking Nixon's hand didn't go down too well in Vietnam. In fact, it was viewed as a downright hostile betrayal of the China-Vietnam relationship. It took a huge hit from that. The Vietnam, the Vietnam leadership didn't use these words, but essentially they asked China, how could you? Well, Vietnam had its hands full finishing off what remained of the SVN regime in the South. This is after the Paris Peace Accords were signed, but before Saigon fell, China decided that time was perfect to go in and assert their historic claim to the Paracel Islands, the Xisha Chindao. I'm not going to get my finger anywhere near that red-hot button. Suffice to say, if you can locate your personal copy of the Wu Jing Zong Yao, an official history of China written sometime during the 1040s, Northern Song, there's a mention of those islands being part of China going back to well, as early as the Tang Dynasty. During the Yuan Dynasty, they sent someone down there and they made the same claims. Paracel Islands, part of China. 
Who knew way back then what those reefs would become? Nobody was saying much until 1887. And one of the upshots of the Sino-French War was that, as part of the agreed-upon boundary, after a lot of huffing and puffing by the Qing government, the line demarcating where the Paracels and Spratleys lie you know, were placed on the China side of the border. But way back during the later Lei Dynasty in Vietnam, 15th century, the Vietnamese too. They used to sail around there, fish in those waters. They built structures and, well, treated the islands as if they owned them. So this became a ticking time bomb that could have gone off at any time. Who knew, back in the Ming Dynasty, it had all come down to this one day. Not quite one year to the day that they inked the Paris Peace Accords, the Chinese and Vietnamese military were firing away at each other in the South China Sea. This was the Battle of the Paracel Islands, January 19th, 1974. Three days prior, the Paracels had been visited by a group of South Vietnamese military types, and they noticed some PLA troops there up to something, so they radioed to Saigon for orders. The Vietnam War wasn't over yet. South Vietnam still existed at this time. So the next day... 30 South Vietnamese troops came ashore one of the island reefs and yanked down a Chinese flag and sent for reinforcements. You always read about these little things that escalate quickly and soon blaze out of control. Well, this was an example of that. Both sides quickly sent four warships each, and on the 19th, after blasting away at each other, the Chinese Navy emerged the solid victor. 53 Vietnamese soldiers killed... The Chinese lost 18. Vietnam wasn't unified yet, so this dust-up in the South China Sea and the ensuing settlement was between the PRC and the South Vietnamese government. After China's stunning victory in the Paracel Islands, the North Vietnamese government, the Socialist Republic, well, in the spirit of communistical brotherhood, they should have sent some sort of congrats to their ally. But they didn't send any. And the following year, after Saigon fell and they unified the country... They said whatever was agreed to between the Chinese and the previous SVN regime didn't concern us. And to this day, Vietnam still claims the Paracels and Spratleys as part of their country. A little point of contention that exists between these two nations. The next five years are going to be contentious to the extreme. A lot is going to happen between Vietnam and China, the Soviet Union, and in Cambodia. Let's look at that now. As soon as Vietnam was unified with the VCP on top, the Vietnam Communist Party, they did the same thing they did in China. There was some serious house cleaning and violence meted out to political enemies. And one of the groups who were suspect were the Hua. In Chinese, we say Hua. In Vietnamese, eh, it sounds about the same. The Hua. H-O-A. These were Vietnam's ethnic Chinese population. And now with the state of affairs between China and Vietnam in the mid-1970s being what it was, after the betrayal of the Nixon visit, after the bad blood that flowed following the Battle of the Paracels, these Hua people, these ethnic Chinese living in Vietnam, their patriotism was questioned. The VCP leadership didn't trust them any further than they could throw them, especially along Vietnam's Guangxi Yunnan border. The Hua, these ethnic Chinese, it didn't matter if a Hua family could trace their presence in the Red River Delta going back 27 generations. They, too, were suspect and began to be hounded out of the country. Many were fleeing collectivization and the nationalizing of assets, namely theirs. And also, like, like Japanese Americans during World War II, the Vietnam government began building these manzanars in the country, and many ethnic Chinese were forced to relocate to these camps and had to face a pretty bleak future. That's why so many Hua exited Vietnam to try their luck elsewhere. This was known as Vietnam's second exodus of refugees. My wife's family came during the first exodus, beginning in April 1975. Those were mostly South Vietnamese with money or ties to the Americans or French. But with this second wave that started 1978-1979, many of Vietnam's 1.5 million Hoa began leaving Vietnam en masse. For most of these refugees from the second wave... 
They had to risk their life escaping in rickety boats and other desperate means. And those of us old enough to remember recall the so-called boat people crisis. Like the first wave in 75, these people were running for their lives, but for altogether different reasons. With the second wave, unlike the first, these people were mostly all ethnic Chinese. The China government saw everything that was going on and demanded a stop to this persecution of the Hua. The Vietnam government opted to ignore the demand and even ratcheted up the pressure. By mid-1977, already about 160,000 Hua had been expelled from the country. Then the following year, Chinese aid to Vietnam stopped. China's leaders continued to keep a close eye on these developments. China-Vietnam relations started heading down a very dark path. Let's quickly look at how everything suddenly unraveled between these two next-door neighbors. As the boat people crisis made headlines around the world, Vietnam upped the ante a little by signing a 25-year mutual defense treaty with the Soviet Union on November 3rd, 1978. This further exacerbated the already strained relationship between China and Vietnam. This didn't mean Russia was going to start parking their warships at Gamran Bay, but it did make China and other nations in Southeast Asia a little nervous about where this was all possibly heading. The Vietnam government had played the Soviets well, knowing how eager they were to bounce back from the fallout of the 1972 Nixon visit to China, not to mention their hopes of, well, enjoying the benefits of Vietnam's warm water ports for their navy. The Sino-Soviet relationship had been going downhill already since 1954, and the two great powers had been at loggerheads all throughout the 60s. The matter of the Soviets was one of the primary motivating factors for both sides that led to rapprochement and the Nixon visit to China in 1972. Over in Cambodia, Salazar, a.k.a. Pol Pot, and the Khmer Rouge had taken power there in April 1975, around the same time the North Vietnamese took Saigon. Pol Pot was a well-known hater of Vietnam. We all know about the Khmer Rouge, no need to rehash all their misdeeds and atrocities here. He was China's dog in this developing fight and was the leader of Democratic Kampuchea. As soon as the Khmer Rouge had taken power, Pol Pot started harassing the ethnic Vietnamese, expelling 150,000 of them. And after he emptied out Phnom Penh, he kept up a series of attacks against these ethnic Vietnamese, not only in Democratic Kampuchea, but across the border, too, into Vietnam as well. It was a very bloody campaign, and ethnic Vietnamese living in Cambodia had to hide out, escape, or else they'd suffer the same fate as any other group being methodically, ethnically cleansed from their homes. These Khmer Vietnamese, too, they took to the sea or they went into Vietnam. So these Khmer Vietnamese fled east to the relative safety of Vietnam, just as a heck of a lot of Vietnamese Hua started leaving in droves. 1978 in China, well, that place was still trying to shake off the horrors of the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping had just been elevated to the top spot in the party, and he sent strong messages to the Soviets, putting them on notice that China wouldn't sit by idly while they tried to expand their presence down in Southeast Asia. The Soviets, however, <laughs> they had other plans. And that warm water port in Vietnam, as far as they were concerned, Deng Xiaoping or no Deng Xiaoping, that port was going to make a fine second home for the Soviet Pacific Fleet. First half of 1977, Vong Nguyen Gap had made two trips to the Soviet Union and concluded agreements to expand military cooperation. This is when the Soviets started sending personnel to Gamran Bay and to Da Nang. The Holy Grail continued to be access to those ports. June 28, 1977, Vietnam joined Comic-Con, a trade organization of communist nations, in as early as the summer of 1978. China knew Vietnam, with Soviet backing, was going into Cambodia. Vietnam was a, well, by now, a Soviet client state, and Cambodia was a Chinese client state. And their interests 
clash down there. And sure enough, in July 1978, Vietnam started bombing Cambodia. Then after four years of border clashes and decaying relations, on Christmas Day 1978, Vietnam invaded Cambodia. And on January 7th, 1979, Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge regime was overthrown. Not such a bad thing. But because Pol Pot was China's man down there, well, this precipitated a major crisis in the relations between Vietnam and, by extension, the USSR and the PRC. The Soviet Union backed Vietnam's overthrow of the Khmer Rouge. And these events are what directly led to the 1979 border war between China and Vietnam. The occupation of Cambodia would come at a high cost, and Vietnam didn't pull the last of their troops out till 1989. Deng Xiaoping was facing a major crisis watching all this happen in his own backyard. He tried like crazy to build bridges around the area to counter this threat posed by this dangerous Soviet-Vietnam alliance. Besides visiting with regional leaders, Deng also went to Japan and the United States to make friends. And he left the U.S. in early February 1979, and relations were normalized. By the way, that's when I first thought, hmm, this this U.S.-China thing might be something one day. And that's when I started studying Chinese four months later after Deng left. Deng considered Vietnam the Cuba of Asia. And he didn't want the Soviets down there encircling China any more than we wanted Soviet missiles so close to us off the coast of Florida. If missiles were put there, China at that time still lacked the firepower the U.S. had during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they had to do something to preempt this. Deng put Vietnam's leaders on notice, saying, you know, in so many words, that, you know, French and American military didn't have the will to fight on after heavy losses, but China was here to stay, so don't mess with them. Deng's plan was to go in, seize a few counties to show Vietnam they could come in any time they wanted to, and then the plan was to go in, do some damage, and then head back across the border to China. Then, After that, keep up a period of harassment along the border. Nothing big, just teach Vietnam a lesson. The Soviets could learn from this too. The message was, don't underestimate China's resolve as far as this matter was concerned. This invasion of Vietnam was China's first time back on the battlefield since the 1962 Indian Border War. Besides this, they were only just a few years out of the Cultural Revolution, We all know from past episodes, the PLA went through hell in China during those 10 years of chaos. Vietnam's armies, on the other hand, were still battle-hardened from their French and American experiences, still so fresh. This Zhongyue Zhanzheng, or, or as the Vietnamese called it, the war against Chinese expansionism, this is sometimes called the Third Indochina War. China, at this time in their history, had three bones to pick with Vietnam. Number one, overthrowing their ally, the Khmer Rouge. They didn't like that. Number two, the years of horrid treatment of ethnic Chinese Hua in Vietnam. And the third thing was the small but defiant occupation of the Spratly Islands that Vietnam maintained. And these were called the Nan Sha Chun Dao. Cognizant of the relationship the Soviets had with Vietnam, before Deng went and informed them of the limited military operation China was planning against Vietnam. He moved almost the entire PLA up to the Soviet border and told them, don't try anything or else. The USSR didn't do anything militarily, but they did provide a lot of military hardware and useful intel to Vietnam's military command. Then the numerically superior PLA invaded Vietnam with about 200,000 troops. Not a small army. Interestingly, U.S. intelligence units were monitoring the whole thing and even asked Deng in person if this was real or a drill. Deng told them this wasn't a drill, just a little punitive mission. Deng Xiaoping had intended for the PLA to go deal with their recalcitrant little brother in this 2,000-year-old relationship. He had told uh, Jimmy Carter during the 1979 visit that uh, 小朋友不听话, which means that little friend of ours doesn't listen to what we say. We have to go in and spank him. February 17th, 1979. 
China crossed the border into Vietnam. It started off good with a rapid and effective Chinese march into the north of Vietnam, taking Lang Son on March 6th. This was the northeast province that was right on the Guangxi border. They had carried out an effective fight and inflicted a lot of damage on both the Vietnam military and civilians. China may have inflicted heavy damage on Vietnam, but it should also be pointed out at the cost of over 7,000 killed. That's quite a large number for such a short war. In Vietnam, the number was even greater, with so much national honor at stake. Neither side was terribly forthcoming, and there's no figures that could be taken with any certainty about casualties. The cost of this war economically had a huge impact on China and the new economic plans that were underway. They weren't sitting on the kind of national wealth they have now. The purpose of the invasion was to teach Vietnam a lesson for Cambodia and to show off to the Soviets and anyone else who was looking the new and improved PLA. After heavy casualties and logistical nightmares, China began their withdrawal on March 5, 1979, and completed it on March 16th. The war with China led to even more Hua being expelled from Vietnam. These refugees ended up escaping to cities and countries all over the world. They either got there themselves or were placed there by any number of NGOs that dealt with the crisis all throughout the 80s and 90s. A lot of them ended up in Santa Ana and Westminster, California. Not far from me. My wife worked at one of those Vietnamese refugee camps for Save the Children in Hong Kong when we were living there. Not only the civilians, even the Communist Party members in Vietnam who were Hua, they got expelled. The late 70s was a long, hard purge from the country of these Hua people. Vietnam cozied up closer than ever to the Soviet Union, letting them in to Gamran Bay, defiant about the isolation they were feeling, especially with China having permanent member status in the UN Security Council now. There had been some bad blood between Vietnam and China over the centuries, but post-1979 border war, (laughs) relations were on the rocks. Dust-ups along the border continued to happen. Then, in 1987... China began beefing up their profile on a few of the reefs in the Spratly Islands. Early the next year, Vietnam sent out a team to go monitor what was going on, what were these Chinese up to. And this led, of course, to a confrontation that didn't end well for Vietnam. This was on March 14, 1988, and was known as the Johnson South Reef Skirmish. This kept the waters boiling in and around the Spratlys. The Vietnam government, to this day still hasn't given up their claims over the Paracels and Spratleys. China's claims to the South China Sea back when all this happened haven't changed much from what they are today. It's a major bone of contention that continues on into our very own times. Once the Soviet Union up and died on December 25, 1991, and after Vietnam had removed the remainder of their troops from Cambodia, the stage was set for a possible improvement in China-Vietnam relations. There was a secret summit held in Chengdu in September 1990. I remember it well when it was announced. I was living in Hong Kong at the time. Vong Nguyen Giap himself, the deputy prime minister, snuck into China under the cloak of the Asian games going on at the time. And then these two neighbors, with so much shared history that we looked at these past six episodes, they started talking and began to warm up to each other diplomatically at least. Jiang Zemin returned the favor in 2002 and visited Vietnam to go spread good cheer. Now, relations with China normalized in 1991, and all border and frontier issues were worked out by 2008, including sea borders in the Gulf of Tonkin, at least. But after everything that had happened since 1979, not to mention for the 2,000 years before that, the relationship remained in a potentially volatile state. Former Vietnam President Trung Tan Sang visited Beijing in 2013 with Li Keqiang repaying the favor. During Premier Li's visit to Vietnam at the invitation of then Prime Minister Nguyen Tan Yung in October 2013, a joint statement was signed between the two leaders that called for, quote, friendly neighborliness, comprehensive cooperation, long-term stability, and looking towards the future, 
end quote. And in the spirit of, quote, good neighbors, good friends, good comrades, and good partners, end quote. Hey, sounds good to me. The current Vietnam state president is Chen Tai Guang. Nguyen Phu Chong is party general secretary, and the PM who succeeded Nguyen Tan Yong is Nguyen Sun Phuc. This is as of May 2018. In 1994 came U.S. recognition of Vietnam and the establishment of an embassy in Hanoi. As far as I know, the relationship is going in the right direction. Having the stars and bars sailing around those waters keeps things interesting. The South China Sea is still an issue without a resolution as far as China-Vietnam relations go. There have been a number of flare-ups, but both nations are still working on a resolution. Close call, though, in May 2014 with the China National Offshore Oil Corporation attempting to drill for oil 150 miles off the Vietnam coast. This one got dicey until China agreed to remove the rig. This offshore rig really brought the Vietnamese protesters out into the streets. A lot of anti-Chinese sentiment was blown off. Even the Vietnam government couldn't contain the outpouring of emotion over what was felt to be, well, a blatant provocation, not to mention an affront to Vietnam's national sovereignty. Five Chinese were killed on the streets of Vietnam as a result of the riots. The occasional fisherman gets caught in the nets of this problem in the South China Sea every now and then. The Vietnam military... It's no match for the PLA, so there's only so much that can be done by force of arms. There's a simmering acrimony for China in Vietnam that the government can depend on whenever it feels the urge to play the nationalism card. But these two great nations, with their long history, have more to gain by seeking friendship than being at each other's throats. I hope it works out well for both sides. Okay, folks, I think we'll wrap things up here. We managed to squeeze a lot of information into a mere six episodes. I know Vietnam isn't one of the most popular histories offered in high school and college. Just as there are thousands and thousands of scholars who study China and academic institutions, think tanks, and NGOs around the world, same with Vietnam. Maybe there's someone out there who will perhaps think about a Vietnam history podcast or maybe a History of Vietnam podcast. Either way, I'll subscribe. Three books I recommend if you want to fill in all the empty spaces I left in the past six episodes. Amazon links to all these books are listed on the website. My main source, Yale professor Ben Kiernan, Vietnam, A History from Earliest Times to Present, and Cornell professor Keith W. Taylor's A History of the Vietnamese, and Christopher Gasha's. Vietnam, A New History. Professor Gasha from the University of Quebec in Montreal. There's quite a bit more than these three great history books. I was thankful to have them by my side for the past few months. Okay, my friends, that is going to be that for this time. Onwards and upwards, the next great thing here at the China History Podcast. Yeah, proud member of the Recorded History Podcast Network. I'm sure you've all checked out the great history shows available on that network, recordedhistory.net. Once again, let me encourage you to go to tsens.com, T-E-A-S-E-N-Z, Dot com and search for CHP, and you'll find my latest offering to all tea lovers. Guizhou Mei Tan Cui Ya Green Tea. Cui Ya means emerald tips or buds. Mei Tan, well, that's the place they came from. Beautiful and exciting Guizhou province. All these ethnic minority people there, Miao, Yao, Dong, Bu Yi, and many other groups. And did I say tea? Tea has been grown in Guizhou since... Even before the days of Shandong. Didn't we mention him in part one of this series? China and Vietnam's shared ancestor. Anyway, try it out, ladies and gentlemen. Guizhou Mei Tan Cui Ya Emerald Tips First Flush Green Tea. Only the best. For the best listeners a history podcaster could ever dream of. If that's not a case of Pai Ma Pi, I don't know what is. Again, go to tsens.com, search CHP, or go to the link on my webpage. Thanks, everyone, who stuck with the program for all six episodes. I don't know about all y'alls, but from the process of researching and presenting this topic to you, my knowledge, understanding, and appreciation of Vietnam history has gone from almost but not quite nothing 
to, well, in the Hong Wen household here that I belong to, next to my father-in-law, one of the nicest and most generous people you could ever meet. Next to him, I may be the smartest one in the family when it comes to the history of the old country, their ancestral homeland. I'm already hard at work on the next topic. Be looking for that in the next few weeks or so. You never know with me, do you? I get them out whenever I can. Hey, go listen to some of the old stuff if you haven't heard any of them in a while. I listened to one the other day, and I thought, did I do that? I'd subscribe. I'm going to go give five stars and write a glowing comment, too. My Facebook and Twitter followers will all tell you, gee, this guy doesn't post or tweet too often. But don't let that stop you from joining our little CHP community. I do check in every now and then with all the latest goings on here, so you might want to consider that. Okay, mes amis, c'est tout pour le moment. Let me get cutting on this new episode or series, we'll see. And when it's ready, you could all come to the launch party. Okay, enough with the idle chit-chat. This here's Laszlo Montgomery coming to you for the 202nd time. Oh, you must be tired of me by now. Signing off once again from the sunny and fantastical Los Angeles, California. Thanks again, everybody, and already, I can't wait to see you again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.